All right, guys, welcome back to the Red Light Report. This week, we are going to listen to my presentation in Italy that I did back in November, mid-November in Rome, Italy. So I've been long awaiting this audio and video file. So if you want to watch the, the presentation, you can watch the video version on YouTube, of course. But regardless, this was a fun presentation. I was invited, I think it was around November 2021. So it was a year in the making. And it was my first time going international and presenting and talking at a conference. So it was really exciting. And so this was at the, uh, <laughs> I'm going to butcher this, but be prepared. The Scuola di Medicina e Nutrizione Funzionale. Or Funzionale. So if you're Italian over in Italy listening to this, you're probably laughing your head off. But for those that are from America, that was probably decently close. So <laughs> um, I apologize for everyone that'll listen to that. But regardless, it was a school of functional medicine and nutrition. So it was a pretty large gathering. I think there were, if I were to guesstimate, 50, 60, maybe 70 people in the crowd. It was just a fun experience for me. Most of the people there were Italian speaking, of course. And so I was one of three English speaking presenters. I think another one was from the UK and the other English speaker was from Sweden. And so I was a representative from the United States of America. So again, it was a fun presentation and it was kind of interesting because as one of the few English speaking people there, they had a booth in the back of the room there where there was a couple of people that would interpret what I was saying into Italian. And so the vast majority of the people in the crowd had these headsets on. And so as I was presenting in English, I had to be cognizant of speaking more slowly and methodically to allow the interpreters to then interpret what I was saying into the headsets of the people that were wearing the headsets. So I didn't necessarily hear the interpreter speak in Italian, but that's what the crowd was was hearing was my interpreting my English into Italian. So it, regardless, it was a fun experience and it sounds like we're in the works of having me sent back there this November to dive into some different topics regarding photobiomodulation. So I'll be excited to return. And by then there's going to be much more new information, new innovative products, and of course, new photobiomodulation research I'll be able to present on. So that'll be exciting. Again, this has been a long time in the making to release my presentation to you guys. So I'm excited to finally do that. And serendipitously, it falls on the 100th episode of the Red Light Report. So kind of crazy that not too long ago, we were celebrating the 100,000 download mark. And this week, we're celebrating the 100th episode of the Red Light Report. So again, thank you all who have been here from the beginning, from the middle, for all those that are just joining me recently on the Red Light Report. I appreciate all your support. And without further ado, enjoy my presentation in Rome, Italy in mid-November. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. I just want to first off thank everyone I've been coordinating with over the past year. Um, I can still remember back in last November when uh, I was talking with people about this specific symposium and here I am across the pond from America. And I was just thinking about this. At my local time, I went to bed at three in the afternoon and I'm giving a presentation at two in the morning. So it's, it's kind of a wild ride. And if I end up speaking too quickly, which I can do for the translators, people just start raising their hands so I can slow it down a little bit. So yes, I am the founder and CEO of BioLite, which is a red light therapy company. We do ship worldwide, but it's predominantly in America. And just a quick background on myself, I am a physical therapist in the United States. I graduated in 2016, and after a month or two, was quickly disgruntled with how I was being used, which was more or less part of the system in America where we use insurances. And by and large, insurances can be good, but as a, as a practitioner, they can also dictate how you treat. And what I mean by that is... I may want to use certain treatment techniques that I feel are best for my patient, but insurances might not reimburse that. So then your boss or the clinic you're working for might not want you to use those treatments. So I got disgruntled with that. So I started my own private practice where it was a cash-based practice. So then insurances couldn't dictate how I treat. And so when I opened my practice, 
I wanted to utilize holistic yet effective approaches uh, to kind of be unique and stick out, but of course still be effective for my patients. I don't know if you guys have dry needling in Italy. You might, okay, you do, cool. So I became an expert and well-known for dry needling, which is amazing for pain relief of, of all sorts and types. Then I adopted other holistic approaches like blood flow restriction training, hyperbaric oxygen, cupping. And it was along this path of learning about these holistic treatments that I came upon red light therapy. So really up until the end of 2018, I didn't really know anything about red light therapy. I had minimal respect for light itself, meaning even the sunlight. I just thought it was something that lit up the sky and when it went away, it got dark at night. But it was when I discovered red light therapy that I was blown away with its mechanisms of action, which we'll cover thoroughly. And the research, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of articles crossing many types of health conditions on how red light therapy can improve your health and, and longevity. And so that's when I decided, I looked at the market, in, especially in America, and thought I could start a company because there were many high quality products for affordable prices, but even more importantly, there was just a lack of education. There's just some very basic rudimentary information, but I felt like if someone could step in and provide a source for high quality information and get the masses exposed to this amazing technology and this amazing healing modality, then that was my reason for starting the company. Now jumping into the topic at hand here, what's all the hype about with red light therapy? Because just how many people have heard of it prior to this presentation? How many people have heard of red light therapy? So not even half, which is pretty cool. I'm in a way about half. So some people have been exposed, but most people, and this is kind of a health specific symposium. So if we went out into the public, it'd probably drop to like below 1%. Many people don't know about red light therapy, but if you have, of course, you know, it can treat so many different things. It can help with pain relief, oral health, brain health, eye health, hair health, exercise, woman's health, the immune system. And this isn't all encompassing. This is just some of the things that red light therapy can help with. And these are all backed by research. This isn't just anecdotally or, or we're hoping it helps. It's backed by research pretty rigorously. And so when you start talking about how red light therapy can help with all these different things, it starts to sound like a snake oil pitch, like it's too good to be true. Because on top of all these things it can help with, it's also non-invasive. You're, you're just using light. It's non-pharmacological. Of course, there's a time and a place for using pharmacy, but there's a lot of side effects with those as well. You can do it in the comfort of your home compared to going through, let's say, a surgery or a lifetime of dependency on, on drugs and pharmacy. It's a very cheap option, so to speak. So very high reward, very low risk, and quite affordable, relatively speaking. When we talk about red light therapy, there's three main mechanisms I want to cover or at least talk about uh, that happens when you use red light therapy. And when I say red light therapy, that encompasses both red and near infrared light. So the red light is that visible red light we all see in those pictures of, of people using these devices. And near infrared, of course, just like infrared sauna, is invisible, so we can't see it. So there are two different spectra of light. They do the exact same thing, which we'll cover, which is they reduce inflammation or they modulate inflammation, but for the most part, that's reducing when we're talking about diseases. It improves circulation and it optimizes mitochondrial health, which we'll get into pretty heavily here in a second. And so those are the three main things that happen whenever you expose your body to this red and near infrared light. The difference between the two wavelengths is that the red, uh, the red light being a shorter wavelength doesn't penetrate any deeper than the skin. So when you're thinking, treating you know wrinkles or wound healing or you know making your face look nice and smooth that's the red light whereas the near infrared light since it's a longer wavelength it's going to penetrate deeper and so that's uh, the wavelength you must integrate if you're treating anything deeper than the skin which would be like the the muscles bones and ligaments any organs the brain you need to use near infrared for that and so we're going to get uh, relatively deep into the science here but always remember we're talking about exposing your body to red and near infrared light. So that's what it all comes back to is exposing your body. And that's the other thing with red light therapy is your skin must be exposed where you want to see results. 
So you can't do it with clothes on. So if you want to get your stomach, you, the light has to be, or your stomach has to be exposed. If you want to get your back, your back has to be exposed and so on. But, but back to one of the main mechanisms of red light therapy, which is optimizing mitochondrial health. And Paul talked about it a little in his, in his lecture before me. The mitochondria produce essentially all of the energy in our body. And I'm not just talking about like caffeinated energy where you get hyped up and, and energetic. It's just the energy to carry out our physiological functions on a day-to-day -day level. Interestingly, all of our mitochondria is handed uh, maternally. So we get our mitochondria from our mom and from their mom and so on and so forth. So if you want a general idea of the potential of your mitochondrial health, you can get a general idea by looking at your mom's health or how is your, your grandma's health and longevity and, and so on and so forth. Um, again, mitochondria produce 95% of the energy in our body and from an energetic perspective or a bioenergetic perspective the more energy you have in a cell the less disease it'll have said another way the less energy you have per cell or the less energy that mitochondria is producing the more disease you will have or the quicker you will age and we know that because of Dr. Doug Wallace, who's quoted there on the screen, who's the top mitochondrial researcher in the world with over four decades of research. And that's what he has found. The more energy we have per cell, the less disease we have. And so again, just, just to kind of do a quick recap, if we expose our body to red and near infrared light, and that improves ATP production, then we're inherently, hopefully reducing the disease state in those cells that are being irradiated by red light. But moving on with the mitochondria, Dr. Doug Wallace again here, uh, he says that about 80% of all modern diseases are directly tied to mitochondrial dysfunction. And a dysfunctional mitochondria can be uh, summated by saying that it's not producing enough energy. So again, when we have too many mitochondria not producing energy as they should, then we start seeing this widespread or, or, or an array of different kinds of diseases, which I'll, which I'll show you here in a second. And we'll get to sunlight here in a second. We'll, I'll just wait for that. But here's a list. Of course, it's in English. I'll, I'll say some of it so you guys can understand. But, but the screen shows everything on the screen um, is directly tied to mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is just to impress upon you all that everyone probably knows, you know, a friend or family member or even personally, someone who's had a neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, an autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, psychiatric uh, conditions like bipolar, schizophrenia, autism. Then of course we have cardiovascular diseases, gastrointestinal orders, uh, disorders, uh, diabetes, metabolic disorders, and it goes on and on and on. And once again, all of those diseases are directly tied to too many dysfunctional mitochondria in the body. So just a quick review in biology, cells make up tissues, tissues make up organs, and of course, organs make up systems such as the uh, central nervous system here. When we're talking mitochondrial dysfunction, we gotta go one step uh, even further for the true root cause of disease. Again, dysfunctional mitochondria means not being exposed to enough sunlight, which includes red and near infrared light. So uh, too many dysfunctional mitochondria, you're gonna end up with a dysfunctional cell. A couple of dysfunctional cells isn't a big issue, but it's when you have too many dysfunctional cells, you eventually have a dysfunctional tissue. And this is typically the stage where we start seeing different diseases and diagnoses of sorts. And again, we have too many dysfunctional tissues, we're gonna end up with a dysfunctional organ, and of course, too many dysfunctional organs, you're gonna have a dysfunctional system, and that's one step away from death, essentially. So, said another way, if you're consistently exposed in your body to sunlight, or if you're consistently exposed in your body to red and near infrared light, you're gonna have healthy mitochondria, which make healthy cells, healthy tissues, healthy organs, and healthy systems. So just to step back from red light specifically for a moment, just to have some appreciation for sunlight, uh, this is a pretty interesting piece of research. It's a 2014 study out of Sweden 
that demonstrated low levels of sun exposures are a risk factor for human health equivalent to that of being a cigarette smoker. And walking around uh, Rome, I noticed everyone in their dog has a cigarette, so I don't know if this is <laughs> going to hold as much weight, but regardless, it's, it's a pretty powerful study showing just by getting exposure to sunlight or not getting exposure, your health can be up or down because of that. And it, it was a pretty big study. It looked at 30,000 females over 20 years and found that women with the lowest sun exposure had a two-fold increase rate of death compared to the woman with the most sun exposure. So pretty, pretty interesting. And as much as I love red light therapy, of course, I'm a massive advocate for getting that consistent sunlight. This study alone would be why. And another topic we have to cover when discussing red light therapy is the concept of malillumination, because that goes hand in hand with what we're talking about. Just like we're here, there's no windows. We're in the basement, I think, and we're, we're under non-native light. So this is basically the worst scenario for our, our biology, for our cells. Granted, of course, hopefully we go outside at some point today after this. But the point being malillumination, we spend too much time indoors, not enough time outside in the sun, uh, especially compare that to our ancestors, of course. They were never inside. They were always outside doing what they had to do to survive. So we're doing a double whammy where not only are we indoors and out of the sun, but we like to be in front of our screens at night, which wrecks our circadian rhythm because our, our screens at night have that blue light or that blue lit technology. And blue light inherently inhibits melatonin production because blue light increases cortisol as it should. Like in the morning when we wake up, we see that sunlight, which has blue light that wakes us up. That cortisol wakes us up. But when we do it at night, again, we're telling our body that it's basically the middle of the afternoon or, or it's noon. And, and uh, again, it inhibits melatonin, which wrecks our circadian rhythm. And, and we could have an entire speech or, or talk about the health woes of, of a poor circadian rhythm. As many of you know, BioLite recently released its newest product, the Adapt System. And so this is BioLite's take on the full body 360 degree red light therapy treatment. Most of the products out there like that are red light therapy beds that completely enclose you, kind of like a capsule or those tanning beds. While those are nice and they're beneficial, they take up a lot of space. For those that are claustrophobic, they're not user friendly. The Adapt System includes a red light therapy table that's on wheels so it's mobile and a red light therapy panel that is on an apparatus that allows you to literally lower or increase the height of on a motorized platform as well as you can rotate that panel 360 degrees so you can get it precisely how you want it. The adapt system again includes that table to lie on, the panel that you can raise and lower just above the body or a couple of feet above the body or you could use just the panel for standing treatments or for lying on a different surface and so the adapt Adapt system includes both products, but you can also purchase just the Adapt table or just the Adapt panel based on your needs. Right now, with the new release of the Adapt system, Violite is offering 15% off the first 10 purchases that can include just the Adapt table, the Adapt panel, or the entire Adapt system. You are one of the first to hear about this innovative, cutting edge, patent pending technology. And so if you want to jump on that 15%, I would recommend purchasing as soon as possible. If you have any questions about the Adapt system, please reach out to BioLite either through Instagram at BioLite.shop or email info at BioLite.shop. The lights, both the red and near infrared, is customizable. So you get to choose exactly which wavelengths of red and near infrared that you want. And if you need help choosing, as this is tailored towards physicians and med spas and recovery centers and gyms and yoga studios of that sort. So if you need help choosing which wavelengths would be best for your patient or client population, you'll be able to conversate with me directly so I can help you decide which wavelengths would be best. And along with the customizable LEDs, you can literally increase and decrease the intensity of the light with a turning knob. So from 1% up to 100%, you get to dictate the power of the light. And so this gives you maximal versatility with your full body 360 degree red light therapy treatments with the products themselves, the table and the panel, but also the versatility with the customizable LEDs and the ability 
to increase and decrease the intensity of the light at will. The Adapt System, 15% off the first 10 purchases. Email info at biolight.shop or reach out to us at biolight.shop on Instagram. Uh, but the point here is there's ways to combat this with red light therapy, exposing your body, exposing your cells, exposing your mitochondria to that red and near infrared light to send it the correct signals. Digging a little deeper into the science here. Okay, so we've talked about the mitochondria and its impact for energy production. So how does it respond to red and near infrared light? It's because of this chromophore, which is a, a light acceptor called cytochrome C oxidase. And this is why it's red and near infrared light that makes up red light therapy, and not green light or blue light or orange light. It's because of the cytochrome C oxidase that specifically responds to the red and near infrared light. And, and this uh, squiggly thing is the best uh, Google picture I could find of cytochrome C oxidase. And it's being irradiated by that red and near infrared light, which makes it happy. It's, so then the cytochrome C oxidase is excited by the light. It dissociates nitric oxide from the cytochrome C oxidase, which allows oxygen in. Otherwise, nitric oxide just sits on top of the cytochrome C oxidase, so to speak, and does not allow oxygen in. But when exposed to light, again, it dissociates, and that's where we get that improved circulation from red light therapy, because nitric oxide, of course, is a vasodilator. So when exposed to light, we get that nitric oxide release, oxygen goes in, and we get that efficient ATP production we're looking for, so we get more energy in our cells. But when we don't have the proper light exposure, when we have that malillumination, again, that nitric oxide is gonna to bind to cytochrome C oxidase. It's not gonna release, oxygen cannot get in, and we're gonna have inefficient ATP production or sub-threshold energy levels that we want. And as I mentioned at the top of the conversation here, the less energy you have per cell, the more disease state you're probably gonna have. So now we're going inside of the mitochondria. So bear with me for a moment. We are inside the mitochondria in the electron transport chain, which is composed of, or is comprised of, five respiratory proteins. And we can think of these as rocks in a river. You're trying to get across to the other side of the river and you have to jump on rocks to get to the other side. We want these respiratory proteins as close together as possible for efficient electron transport because in the end, we want electrons essentially to go from here all the way to here to produce ATP. If they don't make it all the way across, if they fall somewhere in between these little holes or gaps, I should say, they're not gonna make it to the end and they're not gonna make ATP. In fact, by, by falling into these gaps, they're gonna be oxidated and they're gonna add to the free radical load Mitochondria are already the number one generator of free radicals in the body. Normally, that's normal, but with my amazing technology, I squish the picture and we have more efficient tunneling of the electrons because those respiratory proteins are closed. That's a healthy mitochondria. That's a healthy um, electron transport chain. That's normal. And again, less ability for the electrons to spill out as they move down the chain. And again, this is important because we want as many electrons making it through to produce ATP. But when the opposite happens, when the electron transport chain gets stretched, that's when we have less efficient tunneling of electrons. And again, they fall through those gaps. They're not gonna make ATP, so less energy production and more free radical production. So that naturally begs the question, well, what stretches the electron transport chain? because anything that stretches that is going to decrease energy production is, and is gonna make for a dysfunctional mitochondria. So things that we've already talked about, blue light, and I'm not talking about uh, a blue light that's in the sun because that's balanced by all the other wavelengths. It's more so the blue light from technology where it's a very high concentration of blue light and that's all your eye and that's all your brain is perceiving. It's, it's foreign to our body, it's not normal. So that can stretch the mitochondria, non-native, electromagnetic ra radiation. So we're thinking like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 5G, things like that. It's invisible to us, but it damages and it stretches the electron transport chain. Stress can do that. A poor diet can do that. Um, a mismatched circadian rhythm can do that. So all these things we know as being unhealthy, 
they're in a way contributing to this stretched electron transport chain. And that's just one of the pieces to the puzzle of why those things are unhealthy and can lead to disease. I, I kind of mentioned this, but there's a theory called the mitochondrial theory of aging. And that's where the mitochondria is the main source of free radicals, like I talked about, just naturally through ATP production. We're going to have electrons that spill out. That's normal. But it's when it becomes excessive, uh, it leads to accelerated aging. Uh, we can consider the mitochondria our biological clock because, again, it seems that the healthier we can keep our mitochondria, the longer we can keep them from becoming dysfunctional, uh, the slower we will age. Another principle to consider is the concept of redox potential. And that's where we want our bodies to have as much of a negative charge as possible, which may seem counterintuitive. But the, the greater your redox potential or the more negative you are, so to speak, the greater you have an affinity for electrons and you want electrons, because again, we want as many electrons running through that electron transport chain to produce energy because that's a healthy body, that's a healthy cell. And so that also explains why things like light is so healthy. It, it's electrons, it's a way to accrue free electrons. That's why hydrogen rich water or electron rich water is so good for you, it's anti-inflammatory. That's why grounding is so powerful, it's another way to accrue free electrons. Walking by the ocean, getting those negative ions another way to get free electrons. So this in part explains why all of those separate practices are so healthy because your body is accruing more free electrons. And again, electrons equal energy. To wrap up the, this section of science, kind of like I explained, the more electrons you have, in theory, the less inflammation you're gonna have. So a sick body, doesn't have, doesn't have enough electrons. It's, if you don't have enough electrons, you're gonna be more acidic. And so that's why all of these practices that are electron accruing, like I mentioned, the grounding, hydrogen rich water, walking by the ocean, light, that's why they're all anti-inflammatory. Because again, electrons when added to the body can take a, an, a sick body or an acidic environment and move it to a more neutral or alkaline state, which would be anti-inflammatory. So again, anything you can do to accept free electrons will help decrease inflammation and improve mitochondrial function. So moving on to the research side of things to kind of prove the red light therapy really does work. I did this a couple of years ago at this point, but I was just curious, how steep has the growth been for red light therapy? Because I, I know it's getting more popular, so I was, I was curious. So I looked from 1900 to 1950. So the first 50 years of the 20th century, we had about seven research articles. And that's with the Google Scholar search of photobiomodulation, which is the, the scientific term for red light therapy. So the first 50 years of the 20th century, seven articles. So it was on the map, but not really. Then the subsequent 50 years, it jumped to 370 articles. I mean, still not a ton for 50 years, but a drastic increase from seven. And then I broke up the, uh, the 2000s into two decades and it jumped from 370 articles to over 2000. And then the most recent decade is more or less 11,000 plus articles on photobiomodulation. Part of that's the interest and then part of that is because there's so many different ways that red light therapy can impact our health. So we will go through some of those now. A lot of the ways that they help are gonna sound familiar because we've already talked about them. So it might get a little redundant, but I think it kind of puts the proof in the pudding, so to speak. So anxiety and depression. We know that red light therapy can help improve circulation. It can help with mitochondrial dysfunction. And sure enough, in the research here in the article, red light therapy helped with mitochondrial dysfunction, helped improve circulation or oxygenation. And specifically when it comes to anxiety and depression, it seems that the frontal lobe is where there can be issues or where there can be dysfunctional mitochondria, where there can be poor circulation. So simply by irradiating your brain or the front of your brain with near infrared light, you can help improve those symptoms. Eye health, this is a pretty popular one and it can get a little 
dicey because of course the lights can be so darn bright, uh, but it's good to know that uh, improving eye health through red light therapy, the dosages are much, much, much lower than most of the other treatments. So when people are standing in front of their panels normally for five or 10 minutes, for the eyes, you really only need 30 to 60 seconds. So people need to take that into consideration. But regardless, there's a lot of positive research for eye health. But once again, we'll see that the near infrared, and this says far red, that's not to be confused with far infrared. That just means the far end of the, the visible red light. Uh, but regardless, red and near infrared light improves mitochondrial function, reduces oxidative stress, and modulates inflammatory mediators, amongst other things. So again, doing a lot of the same things that it did for, for the brain, but for the eyes, and we're seeing those positive results. Fat loss. This is pretty interesting. So a group of 20 women riding stationary bicycles for uh, three times per week. One group was exposed to near-infrared light, the other group was not. The group that was exposed to near-infrared light lost 444% more fat than those who were not exposed to the light. So pretty riveting, pretty powerful. The only difference is one group was being exposed to invisible light and they lost a lot more fat. Speaking of fat, gut health. There's a couple of interesting, this is one of the new areas of red light therapy. I'm pretty excited about gut health. They used red and near infrared light. I'm not sure if the red light would make it through your gut or your adipose tissue to get to the gut. Uh, but regardless, they used red and near infrared. Delivered to the abdomen, and you can literally alter the health of the microbiome. You can literally increase beneficial bacteria, decrease harmful bacteria, and thus improve that ratio for a healthy gut microbiome. But taking it a step further, and that was back in 2019. So again, they're targeting the gut or gut flora targeted photobiomodulation. Not only does it regulate the gut microbiome, but through the gut brain axis, you're also able to change signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's or dementia just by treating the gut, not even treating the brain. So I think this is an area of neurodegenerative disease, especially Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, where we're gonna see a lot more red light therapy used. And that's not to say you, you can't or shouldn't treat the brain, but this is just to show the power of the gut brain axis using red light therapy. Oral health. One of the most underappreciated aspects of red light therapy is, or, is oral health, because there's a ton of research in this area. Uh, this one specifically is looking at comparing it to fluoride therapy, and this is for pain relief. So they compare it to fluoride therapy. Again, one, one group got red light therapy, the other got fluoride therapy. The one that got the, the red light therapy achieved pain relief of upwards of 86, 87%, and the control group that only got fluoride had pain relief up to 27%. So over, over um, three times more pain relief just by adding that near infrared light. Another aspect of oral health, somehow, and this is an interesting one, they were able to uh, resist enamel erosion, which is pretty interesting. And the way I think about it is again, back to the acidity or acidic environment. By integrating red or near infrared light, again, we're bringing electrons into the mouth that otherwise has an acidic environment, hence the enamel erosion, but those electrons are gonna take it from an acidic environment to a more alkaline and thus able to resist that enamel erosion. Another one, more or less into the oral microbiome, we just, just talked about the gut microbiome, but you can also improve the health of your oral microbiome. Again, improve healthy uh, bacteria, inhibit harmful bacteria in the mouth. And if you talk to a, a biological dentist or a holistic dentist, the downstream effects of a healthy oral cavity is profound. You can, you can affect every part of your health through your mouth. So again, by improving your oral health, whether it's through red light therapy or otherwise, but pretty powerful through red light therapy, you can affect your body systemically. One more on, on oral health, I believe. And this is probably the most popular reason red light therapy is looked into for oral health and it's, it's surgery. So just like anywhere in the body, you could have a ACL repair, total knee, total shoulder, any type of oral surgery. If you integrate red light therapy, it will heal quicker. The infection rates will go down very far. 
And I would argue that you should also include red light therapy before your surgery if you can. Because as a physical therapist, we're taught, if you know a patient's going to have a total knee, you want to increase or, or get their knee strength as good as possible prior to surgery. So then that recovery process is much quicker post-surgery. So I think along the same lines with periodontal or, or oral surgeries or otherwise, if you can do red light therapy, even if it's just days, but preferably weeks up to a month plus prior to your surgery, your, your uh, recovery process is going to be much quicker. And again, the infection rates will be much lower as well. For pain, this is a very popular aspect of red light therapy. So, so a couple of things here. This, this first meta-analysis looked at red light therapy's ability to reduce pain in patients with musculoskeletal disorders. So we know it works for pain, but for what type of pain? Well, a couple years later, they found out that red light therapies not only can work for pain, but it helps musculoskeletal pain regardless of the cause. So virtually saying any type of musculoskeletal pain, if you have it, red light therapy can help. And again, you'd be wanting to use that near infrared light because that red light only treats the skin unless it's a very super superficial muscle, let's say in your wrist, maybe even in your face, you could use red, but you, you basically want to be using near infrared when treating the muscles or bones. And so again, this is just to display all the different ways red light therapy can help with pain. Again, all of these are backed by research. Low back pain, tendinopathy, acute pain, chronic pain it can help with, plantar fasciitis, headaches and migraines, fibromyalgia, tennis elbow, neck pain. It helps with virtually everything if you have the proper dosages for your treatment. So for the exercise enthusiasts out there, this is a pretty interesting one. We have two types of damage whenever we exercise, especially when we're lifting weights. The first one is primary damage, and that's where uh, the muscle damage is from the exercise-induced stress or, or the mechanical stress. Sorry, that's the secondary. So the first one is just the exercise stress itself. The second damage is from the inflammatory response that ensues post-exercise. So first one's mechanical. Second one is that inflammatory soup, if you will, that happens with exercise at a, at a micro level. Research has shown that if you precondition the body, meaning you do red light therapy prior to your exercise, you can protect your muscles from both primary and secondary damage. Whereas if you do red light therapy only after your exercise, which in a way makes the most sense, it'll only help with the secondary damage. So by preconditioning your body and not doing it any other time, you'll get the best results. And preconditioning is a concept you can do with other things. You can actually mitigate sunburns by preconditioning your, your skin with red light prior to going out in the sun. So then you can be out in the sun longer prior to getting that urethemic response or that sunburn response. You can also precondition your brain if you have a cognitively intensive task. Maybe you have a big day, a big meeting, a big presentation. You can irradiate your brain prior to that task and it's shown to improve your cognitive capabilities. Skin health, and this is probably the number one reason people get into red light therapy. And there's plenty of research on this, but, but this is probably the most basic and straightforward is the red light, whether it's LEDs or, or lasers, can improve wrinkles and skin laxity. Those who received LED red light therapy, 90% reported that they observed a softening of the skin and a reduction in roughness and fine lines. Because red light is very pro-collagen, very pro-elastin, and so that's how you get those anti-wrinkle uh, abilities. And another thing to bring up, this says LED lights. Most of the research in photobiomodulation is done with lasers. And lasers is just, of course, a much more concentrated, well, here's a laser, boom. That's just, just a much more concentrated form of light, whereas lasers, it's a more dispersed light. So lasers can heat the tissue, which is why they're more dangerous. Lasers are more expensive, which that's fine. But the top photobiomodulation researcher in the world, Dr. Michael Hamblin out of Harvard has said that when he's looked at all of the research out there, lasers versus LEDs, the results are comparable. So since LEDs are safer, they're much cheaper or more affordable, 
then it makes sense that all the devices or most of the devices you see on the market are LEDs. Otherwise the prices would be tens of thousands. Sleep, this is kind of an interesting one because in order to affect the pineal gland uh, that's in the middle of your brain, there's not a device externally that could do that. You'd have to do a craniotomy or some sort of surgery to get to that pineal gland. So, so it kind of begs the question, how can light affect your melatonin levels if it can't get to that pineal gland? Well, that's because we have extra pineal tissues. So as long as you can get red and or near infrared light to any of these tissues, the retina, of course, the lens on the eye, the skin, uh, your gut, liver, kidney, thyroid, pancreas, all of those, if you can get light to those areas, you're gonna help with your melatonin production and then of course, uh, hopefully have a more quality sleep because of that. Thyroid health, I think this might be the last area of research here. A couple of powerful articles on thyroid. A study back in 2014 looked at 350 women and all they did was 10 red light therapy sessions and this is for hypothyroidism. So at baseline, their thyroid stimulating hormone was 9.1 and of course the higher that is, the more hypothyroidism you're dealing with. But again, after 10 sessions, the thyroid stimulating hormone normalized in 97% of the women with an average of 2.2. So pretty powerful. And that's why red light therapy is becoming quite popular in the US. I don't know how it is in Italy, but, but thyroid health, not only does it work, but it seems to work pretty darn quickly as well. And speaking of hypothyroidism, there's typically a lot of medication or, or pharmacy that occurs when dealing with thyroid patients or hypothyroid patients. I don't know exactly how many treatments they did, but with consistent red light therapy, almost half the patients were able to stop their medication completely. So pretty powerful. Again, not only does red light therapy work to heal and improve symptoms, but sometimes you're able to get off medication as well. And so this is kind of the slide I think everyone was hoping for. How to use red light therapy. Again, your skin has to be exposed. More is not better. And what I mean by that is, the general consensus when I began uh, to get into the red light therapy side of things, people were saying to use it 20 to 30 minutes every single day. If you look at the research, that's far too much unless you're treating certain neurodegenerative diseases or the spinal cord or the brain that necessitate that much. But in general, that's far too much. Of course, that depends on several things when you're looking at a red light therapy device. So you wanna look at the light irradiance, which is the power of the light because uh, we'll talk about three or four things that dictate the dosage. And when, when you're using red light therapy, getting a quality treatment is all about the dosage. If you undertreat or if you overtreat, and most people overtreat, then you're just not gonna get the results you're looking for. Again, there's no negative side effects from red light therapy. There's no contraindications in the research. It's extremely safe and high reward, as I like to say. But again, back to devices, what to consider, the light irradiance, which is essentially the light power. Uh, you want that around 100 milliwatts to 150 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Most devices have that. The light spectrum, the, the red light should be 660 nanometers. Near infrared should be 850 nanometers. You want some safety metrics. You want to know what the EMF exposure, kind of like what I talked about with that electron transport chain stretching, you don't wanna expose your body to more EMFs than you have to. So find a device that has uh, lowest EMFs as possible and then low light flicker as well. Cause just like these lights, we can't perceive them, but they probably have a pretty high flicker rate. And if we were down here long enough, we'd all go crazy. And that's due to part of the lights having a high flicker rate. But again, in general, for, for general health and wellness, longevity, cause we know if we can optimize mitochondrial health, we can probably have an increased health span or longevity. Using a red light therapy device, that, that's a pretty broad range because that depends on the power of your device, but five to 20 minutes, most days of the week, it can be two, three, four days of the week. You do that consistently, you're probably gonna see some nice health benefits. I use it in a seasonality type of way where it's the summertime, I'm using red light therapy much less because I'm out in the sun. During these summer months, the fall months where, where I live, there's a lot of cloud exposure or a lot of cloud cover. So minimal sun exposure, I'm doing red light therapy much more consistently. Full body treatments are superior because that way all of your cells, all of your mitochondria 
are getting exposed to that red and near infrared light on a consistent basis. And uh, like we, we talked about at the top of this presentation, being able to optimize your mitochondrial health leads to not even necessarily healing a lot of things, but potentially preventing a lot of diseases from, from occurring in your lifetime. So if you can do full body treatments, that, that's the best bang for your buck, I would argue. Um, things you can kind of stack red light therapy with to get a synergistic effect. Exercise while you do red light therapy like that study showed. Get a, get a massive increase of fat loss if that's your goal. Um, if fat loss is your goal, then doing something like exercise while fast. You don't necessarily have to do red light therapy at the same time, but, but doing those three close together, exercise, fasting, and red light therapy. When, when you do red light therapy, especially when you do a full body red light therapy, and my company BioLight did a study last summer that showed one 10 minute session of red light therapy, full body, led to a 122% increase in your HRV. And being able to increase your HRV means being able to tap into your parasympathetic nervous system and decrease your stress. So, so that study showed that simply by doing a 10 minute session, you get an instantaneous decrease in stress. So that alone is a pretty cool uh, benefit to have, but that's why, especially breathing and meditation, if you, if you do that at the same time as your red light therapy sessions, you could get a pretty powerful stress decreasing treatment. Coupling it with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, because there's a lot of mitochondrial boosting capabilities with hyperbaric oxygen. Same with a cryotherapy, whether you're jumping in a river, jumping in an ice bath of sorts, I would say do an ice bath first and then jump in front of your red light therapy. Same with a hyperbaric, do hyperbaric first, then red light therapy. A vibrational plate because vibration is, is a good thing for the mitochondria. And then you have all these supplements or adjuvants that are known to be mitochondrial boosting, alpha lipoic acid, astaxanthin, carnosine, chlorophyll, CoQ10, curcumin, NAD, quercetin, and resveratrol or terastilabine. And that's not an all-encompassing all list. That's just to give you an idea. So to learn more, I do have an ebook that, like I talked about, if you want to do red light therapy as effectively or as efficiently as possible, you need the right protocol. And there's nothing else out there like that, which is why I made it. So the ebook has not only a lot more information, but it has specific protocols. So whether you're trying to treat the skin or something in women's health or your thyroid or pain, there's protocols that'll tell you what distance to be from your device, the duration of your treatment, and then how many times per week to, to have the most effective results. I do have my own podcast, which is predominantly talking about red light therapy, but I also interview other health, wellness, longevity experts, and we have good conversations. And then social media and otherwise is there. And if you wanna get a hold of me, have any other questions about red light therapy or otherwise, email me. Right there, Mike at BioLight.shop. Grazie. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at BioLight.shop and our YouTube channel, BioLight. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.